We've got a very diverse audience here today, but I'd like to ask you all a question. Although most of us are only meeting for the first time, what do you and I have in common? I'm not referring to surface level similarities such as age or race or gender. I'm trying to get at something a little deeper, something that unites not only you and I, but every single person listening to this talk. Today I'm going to be telling you what it is that you and I have in common, but before I get into all that, I first want to tell you a little bit about who I am and why what I'm talking about is so important to me. I'm Threa Sakshi and I'm a junior at Eastlake High School. And growing up, I've been pretty accustomed to hearing terms such as anxiety, depression, and mental health being used all around me by teachers, friends, family, and counselors. However, I never truly understood the significance that any of these terms carried. The entire concept of mental health was sort of foreign to me, something that I unfortunately didn't hold much value towards. However, as I grew older, I began to experience the weight of these terms firsthand, and that's when I realized the importance of mental health. And not only the importance of mental health, but factors that lead to higher rates of mental health, such as stigmas. My first major encounter with stigmas occurred the summer before I went into sixth grade. The story starts off with my kind-hearted and cheerful 11-year-old cousin named Arvind. Arvind lived on a farm in India with his mom, dad, and younger brother. And growing up, there weren't many good resources for schooling in his village, so approaching the school year, his parents would send him to live in a nearby town where there were comparatively better education resources. During school vacations or breaks, he would spend a lot of time at my grandparents' home, which was normally when I got to see him. The summer before I went into sixth grade, I remember him telling me about how he really didn't want to go back to the school. I could tell that something wasn't quite right. It felt as though his personality had completely just changed. I wanted to be there for him as he was quite a sensitive person, but I couldn't quite identify what was going on. He tried to express these emotions to his parents, but they only invalidated him, telling him, you're just a kid and you don't know what's best for you. After all, they were trying to do what was best for him, which in their eyes was to give him a better education, but like many, they never understood the significance of mental health. A few days after my family and I had returned home from India, we received the heartbreaking phone call that would later change my entire perception on mental health and its importance. Arvind had tragically passed away that very summer by taking his own life. Losing a family member due to suicide has been one of the hardest things that I have ever had to go through. It was a huge eye-opener to me because it helped me realize how devastating the effects of mental health can really be. No one took the time to understand what Arvind was going through, and as a result, we weren't able to be there for him when he needed us. My next major encounter with mental health stigmas occurred the summer before my junior year of high school, which actually was pretty recently. This story starts off with a friend I had made way back in seventh grade. His name is Xander. Xander was always a smart, funny, and cheerful type of guy. And upon entering high school, we parted ways a little, but I would always still see him around in the hallways and he always had a smile on his face. However, as quarantine begun, I received terrible news that he was in the ICU due to a suicide attempt. I was utterly shocked, to say the least. Shocked that someone I had known to be the always smart and funny and cheerful guy was actually going through so much and didn't share this burden with anyone due to the mental health stigmas that he experienced around him. The reason I'm sharing these two stories is because I want to make a connection here. Both Arvind and Xander lived in two completely opposite corners of the world with different lives, different obstacles, and different circumstances. So what can they possibly have in common? What they have in common is that they were both affected by the same mental health stigmas, 
which led them to follow the same course of action. Which brings me back to my original question, which was what do you and I have in common? What we have in common is that although we may be a part of two completely different communities, and even though after this talk our lives may never overlap, you and I are still both indirectly or directly affected by the same mental health stigmas. Now I realize I've been using this term stigmas the entire time without really giving a clear definition of what a stigma really is. A stigma is basically an incorrect ideology that prevents mental health patients from seeking professional help. I'll give you an example. This is Alex. She suffers from a mental health disorder. And she knows she suffers from a mental health disorder, but she is too afraid to seek help. I feel so embarrassed. How am I supposed to tell anyone about this? They're all going to hate me. She experiences these self-deprecating thoughts on a daily basis. This is known as self-stigma, where a person internalizes their mental health disorder, thus preventing them from seeking help because they're experiencing these negative emotional reactions, such as drops in self-esteem or self-efficacy. But getting back to the example, let's say that Alex does decide to open up to someone. She opens up to her parents, which, as a lot of you may know, can be really difficult. However, the reaction she receives only makes things worse for her. You look fine to me. People out there are going through so much worse. You're just overreacting. Alex feels completely destroyed. Her feelings are completely minimized. This is known as public stigma, where members of the public hold negative biases about those struggling with mental health illnesses. This can also be seen in media portrayals of mental health. People with mental health illnesses are often portrayed by the media as dangerous or weak or incompetent and scary and many more negative characteristics. Self-stigma and public stigma are only two of the many stigmas as you guys can see on this chart. And these stigmas are really so much more prevalent in our everyday lives than you ever may realize. The following slide shows quotes from people within my own school. Actually, people within my very own grade. Now, you might be wondering, how do we reduce these stigmas in our society? The answer to this question lies in the concept of interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is a pretty broad term, but what it means is when each person within a community has strong interpersonal connections with one another, thus leading to two major things. One, more comfortability in speaking out about mental health, and two, more educatedness within a community about mental health. During COVID, interconnectivity around the world significantly decreased because we weren't able to gather as frequently as we used to or go to school or go to work and etc. According to Mental Health America, the rates of people needing help for anxiety and depression has skyrocketed over the pandemic. So what can we do to decrease stigmas and increase interconnectivity in this post-COVID world of ours? Well, all it really takes is three simple steps. And as I share these steps with you, I want you to think about how you're going to apply them into your own community. Remembering that a community can be anything. It can be your city, your workplace, your school, your town, or maybe even your own household. The first step in this three-step plan is to learn about what specific problems contribute to mental health in your community. For example, the community that I personally wanted to start working on was my school. So all I did to implement this step was intentionally increase my vigilance and analyze at the end of each day how specific aspects of my school environment were impacting some mental health issues that I was struggling with. It didn't take me long to realize that at least in my school, stress surrounding grades and schoolwork was a huge contributing factor to mental health issues, not only for me, but for a lot of my peers as well. And that's all the first step is about. It's about increasing that self and community awareness. Then the next step is to use resources such as social media to increase your interpersonal connections. This includes making clubs, hosting public gatherings or events, making friends, and especially taking time to personally make people feel included and accepted within your community. 
In order to implement this step, all I did was just take a few moments out of my day and reach out to people, some of whom I hadn't talked to in a long time. This is so small, it really only takes a few moments, but such a small reconnection, even if it's one text message or even just one hello in the hallway, can really do so much to make a person feel included and accepted within your community. In one particular instance, I reached out to someone who I had lost touch with for a long time, and after a while of just keeping, on, keeping in touch with her on a consistent basis, she felt comfortable enough to open up to me about her struggle with body image that was actually leading to anxiety, depression, and at one point, suicidal thoughts. I was able to convince her to get professional help, and had I not taken those few initial moments to reach out to her, she may have still been scared to seek this professional help. And now the third and final step is to address the communal problems found in step number one in a personal manner. In order to address the problem that I found in my community, which, as you may remember, was academic stress, I helped my peers create an online repository for AB students who were taking difficult courses. And something else I did was just become an active participant in study groups and let my peers know that they aren't alone in this struggle against academic stress. And that pretty much sums up this three-step plan. All these steps only take a few minutes at most, but still have such a huge significant impact in increasing interconnectivity and thus decreasing stigmas in the long run. Regardless of who you are and what role these stigmas may play in your life, it is still crucial for you to play your part in decreasing them. This three-step plan can be applied by anyone and can pertain to any type of community. So I urge you to implement this into your life today. And remember that one small action that you take today can make a huge significant impact in someone else's tomorrow. You can truly be a change and all it takes is a few moments. Thank you.